thank you to all of you who are logging in for uh, this conversation. I want to welcome you to Architectural Atmospheres, Phenomenology, Cognition, and Feeling. Uh, and this is a talk between Suchi Reddy, Michael Arby, uh, Tonino Grifero, and it's, um, and it's moderated by Bob Condia. Um, as you know, the series of talks that we've been putting together for oh, about two years now, uh, Suchi Reddy, myself, Marcus Nadal, and Michael Spiker, uh, is an attempt to bridge the gap between the, the research that's being done in aesthetics and the professionals in the arts at large. Um, and so we've been, we've been hosting, hosting these uh, conversations uh, every couple of months, more or less for the last two years. Uh, so thank you to all of you who have been attending. Uh, thank you to the commission project uh, and my partner, Michael Suter, who, um, who support the uh, uh, applying aesthetics this effort and you know my partners who I just men mentioned Suchi, Marcus and Michael Spiker. Um, today we have with us, I have my notes here, we have Suchi Reddy who is uh, the founder of Ready Made Architecture. Uh, she's an accomplished architect and artist and it's one of my partners on this applying neuroaesthetics effort. Uh, we have Michael Arbet, whose work is summarized in the title of his first book, Brains, Machines, and Mathematics. He's an accomplished writer and an overall magnificent critical thinker. Uh, we have Tonino Grifero, who's a professor of aesthetics at University of Rome. He is the author of several books, including the, um, including the book Atmospheres, uh, Aesthetic and of Emotional Spaces. And my dear friend, Bob Condia, who's gonna to moderate today. He is a professor of architecture at Kansas State University and a practicing architect and a member uh, of the advisory council at ANFA. Um, and I also want to thank ANFA for helping us spread the word about this, this conversation and to all of you who logged on today. So now without further ado, I'll hand it over to Bob and I'm gonna go uh, camera. Thank you. Well, thanks. Thanks, Pedro. Um, and everyone, uh, again, this is uh, Architecture, Atmospheres, Phenomenology, Cognition, and Feelings. And like the commission, um, I do seek the applied artistry of inf uh, which informs from science and philosophy, the craftsmanship, so to speak, of how do we make human perception part of the architectural and art experience. Um, so as an architect and a design professor have found that uh, the most success synthetic approach to our topic today is to combine phenomenology, neuroscience, and architectural practice. My recent work is with that atmosphere, is within this tripartite matrix is with Dr. Elizabeth Conipon. And you can discover her at uh, Resonance Dash Project, where we're thinking about um, teaching design, discussing phenomenology, talking about scientists around the world and are developing some VR experiments to test what we call the priming effect. Uh, imagine a dark corridor and how it affects the mind in the next space and see if we can get some data on that. So today's um, debate on atmosphere is a pretty large topic. And what we want to narrow it to is making ourselves self-conscious about that which the brain pushes uh, naturally into the background. If, the brain was busy with everything around you all the time, you would have no brain to work with. So the brain pushes atmosphere into the background and lets us see and deal with the situations in front of us. And this is um, part of the work of the architect is to make things slip into the background. So at the risk of being too brief, um, neuroscience, by neuroscience today, we mean the biology of human aptitude when encountering an atmosphere. And by philosophy, we mean phenomenology, which is the history and description of our first person confrontation with spaces. And by architecture, it means something more than mere building, the aesthetic, if unconscious, human relationships that we have with places. So further to borrow from Tonino, um, first definition of atmosphere is that which you left behind when you walked out of the room. 
And the other thing I think this audience recognizes is this codependence that we have with this, um, our relationship with spaces and with atmosphere. When we move into a room, we change it with our presence as others do. So, I mean, uh, this is kind of a big day here, actually, because we have with us Michael Arbib, who's the world's leading neuroscientist on human engagement with buildings. And we have with us Dr. Tanino Grafira, the world's leading philosopher on the argument of atmosphere and architecture. This is a pretty good team. It is, in fact, this the occasion of this webinar that comes from a debate which Michael and Tanino were having and that will become a book called Phenomenology, Cognition, and Atmosphere. And we published by the new, by our, in our series from ANFA um, called Interfaces um, by the New Prairie Press as an open source download that I hope you'll find in a few months. And then lastly, we have with us a very good architect uh, and a student of aesthetics, Suchi Reddy of ready-made architects whose man of unusual manifesto states, form follows feelings. So um, with that brief introduction, um, I think as a group, we agree that feelings fill up an atmosphere and that it's our emotional response that makes atmosphere um, real to us. How that it actually occurs might be the debate. So let me start with Tanino. What, what's, what's your synthetic definition of atmosphere and architecture? And um, can you discuss how you objectify atmosphere from a phenomenological argument? Okay. When I say there is a tension in this room, for example, I'm expressing the qualitative and big something more of a certain situation. It is an atmosphere, even without being uh, able to precisely define and explain it. Situation can be, for me, for example, tense, relaxed, gloomy, etc. The notion of atmosphere has boomed only recently in the humanities, a career that is explained by both the so-called aestheticization in our advanced economies and the interdisciplinary affective turn in all those disciplines that are increasingly focused more on the vague and expressive qualia of reality than on its quantified materiality or defined semantic value. My philosophical atmospherology and pathic aesthetics starts from the neo-phenomenological redefinition of, of philosophy as a self-reflection regarding how one feels within their environment. It tries to examine our everyday atmospheric experience. Atmospheres must be understood not as internal properties of the psychological subject, but as outside constraints, relatively stable and authoritarian entities around which the subject has to revolve. They are, in a sense, more a special and quasi thingly state of the world than a private psychic state. They tonalize and modulate the lived and three-dimensional space whose presence resonates in our felt or lived body so influencing our emotional situation from the outset. An atmosphere then is a feeling poured out in a, into a certain three-dimensional space, inextricably linked to felt, body, felt bodily resonances and whose qualitative nature is inaccessible to an epistemic analytical perspective. For me, it precedes an analysis and influences the perceivers emotional situation from the outset. It may be traced, of course, to a more or less homogeneous set of affordances, understood as atmosphere generators. For Gernot Böhme, for example, movement impressions, synesthesia, scenes, social characters, ecstasies of things, etc. By their affordances, atmospheres tonalize the affective space in which we literally enter and segment this space through boundaries that are not geometrical, but emotional. Atmosphere can capture us, resisting any attempt at projective transformation or can be noted, but not shared, can go unnoticed or even be changed by someone with an opposite and more intense mood, can change or at least take on different nuances over time, etc. 
But even if they mostly occur as an in-between between the perceiver and their environment, in, proto in what they call the prototypical cases, they may even be prior to the constitution of the two poles. This atmospherological approach aims at better explaining expressive qualities as well as social phenomena, phenomena such as collective feelings and emotional states, at not least developing through an increased atmospheric competence, both productive and receptive, a more critical discussion of the media emotional manipulation underlying today's life. Humanities concretely apply the notion of atmosphere in an ever increasing number of fields, such as, first of all, architecture and human geography, but also design, pedagogy, psychotherapy, marketing, politics, sociology, ecological and social anthropology, in short. In every field that problem problematizes the possibility of producing and managing individual or collective emotional states. The first to use it were architecture, urban, urban studies, and geography. They aimed at clarifying in a non-quantitative way people's different attachment to places. For example, how cities and buildings streets and places, traffic and neighborhoods, pathically modulate the perceiver's corporeal space through some specific gestures and directions. The close relationship between architecture and atmosphere is well known. To give just a few examples, for Mark Wigley, architecture is defined by atmosphere. For Akim Han, is the, produ is the production of feelings. For Peter Zumthor, it is responsible for immediate understanding and is generated by everything, even sounds or echoes. So that, as Alasma says, quotation, every building or space has its characteristic sound of intimacy or monumentality, invitation or rejection, hospitality or hostility. Because in short, by framing and structuring our dwelling and generally our affectivity in a place, Architecture generates orientations, kinetic suggestions, markings, thus producing a wide range of atmosphere. Looking for architectural atmosphere means looking into how one feels in a designed space. Atmospheres are whole of affordances, as already said. Affordances are in psychology, as you know, opportunity for action and behavior. But according to my pathic aesthetics, they are also feeling possibilities. They specify not so much possible actions, but rather what feelings they afford. This, this perspective requires extending the meaning of affordance, of course. An affordance-based atmosphere is, uh, modifying the Gibson, is a value affective rich ecological object whose resonance may be emotional, but also contemplative and detached. Certain landscape, for example, affords us to contemplate it in a melancholic way. A church affords us to experience it in humility, or at least in a controlled and meditative way. A successful party affords us to relax. A wooden or velvet material affords to indulge in touching it. A tree standing erect and resisting the powerful sway of the wind affords us to feel strength and obstinacy, an airy and well-designed architectural space affords us to occupy it and freely walk around. In all these cases, we sense a meaningfulness made up of affordances that are widespread in our lived space and generate an atmosphere. My idea, conclusion, is that there are always different filterings and resonances, but of the same atmospheric first impression. This depends on the position of the perceiver's lived body, and not only like pragmatic affordances, to their physical body scaling, or at most their perceptual body schema. Being invitations to feel something without necessarily doing something, atmosphere are bound to the potential of the lived or felt body. One, immediately feels environmental bridge quality motor suggestions, scene aesthetic characters, and appropriately 
reproduces them in one's lived body, thanks to a fed body dynamics that is based on the contraction expansion relationship and only registered in the first person perspective, as you know. This means that an atmospherology must also be a phenomenology of the lived body. This is my position. Thank, thank you, Tanina. Um, turn it over to, to Michael, just a second. The, uh, your notion that feelings are, um, or feeling possibilities are like an affordance is quite interesting. Is that, is that uh, similar to when you discuss quasi? Quasi things. Yeah, okay. I, I don't want to go down that path because that we will scare people if we, if we do that. Um, Michael, what are you thinking? Okay, so I think for um, Tonino, the emphasis is more on the uh, spaces out there and it imposes from the outside an atmosphere on the person. And uh, I want to pursue the idea more of the relationship between the person and the space and the notion that therefore, although there may be a, a generally felt atmosphere for a space, it can also vary greatly between people. Again, I think um, much of uh, Tonino's work focuses on first impression atmosphere. And I would like to also consider the way in which atmosphere may change um, as one uh, goes through uh, time in that space. Okay, let me just briefly say uh, where I come from, very differently from being an architect or, or a philosopher. I was very interested for many years in the brain mechanisms uh, which mediate the relation between perception and action. And so, oh, way back in the 1970s, I got to know the work of Gibson on affordances. But we actually had a debate because he wanted to think that affordances were direct uh, non-conscious effects on behavior. The favorite example is you're walking down the street, you suddenly swerve to avoid a collision because your subconscious processes have realized from peripheral visual data that a collision is imminent and got you to avoid it even before you see that something is on a collision course. But I wanted to emphasize that in addition to understanding the neural mechanisms for such non-conscious processes, there were conscious processes too. In other words, um, yes, I, I could suddenly swerve out of the way, but if I'm trying to move quickly down the street, I might scan to see a gap in the crowd so that I can move faster to go between that gap. And so I wanted to emphasize from the start this interaction between the conscious and the non-conscious as we looked at affordances, but in the basic Gibsonian sense of affordances for action. Now, another track was that I got going with a, a former PhD student on, on putting together a book, a collection with the title, Who Needs Emotion? The Brain Meets the Robot. And so we were explicitly trying to understand what can we learn from the current state of neural study of brain mechanisms underlying emotion? And what can we learn from um, attempts to get robots uh, to have emotion? interesting subject of debate, or at least to elicit emotion. And so with this background, I was uh, <laughs> quite su surprised and impressed and excited to come upon a little book out of Helsinki, uh, a workshop arranged by Johanny Balasma with three speakers, uh, Gernot Burma, um, Thibault, and uh, our friend here, Tonino Grafero. And it was Tonino who said, oh, I want to think of atmosphere as affordances, but now they're emotional affordances. And so um, since then, I've been engaged, uh, amongst other things, in thinking about architecture since the last 10 years in trying to, to get my head around atmosphere. And now I think here is a sort of divergence, and I'm going to close with this. Um, Giernot Burma notes that um, the, the neo-phenomenology tradition from Schmidt to Grafero is very much based on the idea that the atmosphere is there, you feel it. And it's more, uh, the focus is more on how do you feel? Whereas when we come to architecture, I think the architect has two different tasks. One is to empathize with the expected user of the building, 
And so then, if you will, the phenomenology of how you feel atmosphere is crucial. But the other is to say, how do I create um, that atmosphere for different people? And I, I'm looking forward to perhaps Suchi coming in and saying how she has created uh, spaces in which people can feel in, in particular ways. Um, closing on just one technical note, uh, Gernot Burma has offered the notion of generator of atmosphere. And I must say, I'm disappointed by it. Um, he died recently, unfortunately, so he can't defend himself. But uh, basically, the distinction is this. When he talks about generators, he's simply reminding us how multimodal um, the sensory stimuli are that can shape. So think about light and shade, think about noise, think about smell. All of these can affect the atmosphere of a space. But what he doesn't do is try to examine in detail, at least in my limited reading, forgive me if I'm my scholarship, well, my scholarship is limited on this, but um, he doesn't get into, well, how do you just start that feeling? I want to create an atmosphere for the people in my space. How do I go about it? And, and that's probably a pretty good transition to Suchi Reddy, isn't it, Bob? Well, I, I was going to... Uh, interject the um, sometimes fun being a moderator. So <laughs> Danino uses a really interesting example about the bank lobby, the, the, the modern glass bank lobby in which if you're working for the bank, you feel this wonder and grace of being part of something so big as this bank. And you enjoy the lobby from this position of it embellishing your employment. The one coming in for the bank loan in this vast church-like space with big glass walls feels something much different, which is, oh my gosh, now I have to deal with this institution. Will they give me a loan? And I don't know, some, someday it'd be fun to take Tonino to um, Owatonna Bank, which is by Lewis Sullivan. And in this bank, you have red brick walls, which rosy up the light, rose-covered glasses, quite literally. Under arched windows with bucolic blue and green scenes of cattle. And I think this is one of the most democratic spaces ever made so that the banker and the um, client are in the same position. And I think this is pretty good. And he didn't know much about um, neuroscience, but he knew an awful lot about architecture. Tucci, what, what are you thinking? Um, wow, this is so fascinating. Thank you, Tonino. Thank you, Michael. Um, it's so beautiful to hear you both speak. Um, I, you know, I love this idea of um, architecture as um, an affordance for, for feeling, because that's really where I come from. And as a practicing architect, what I can say is that for me, atmosphere becomes, it's always a temporary architectural state. And it's only one aspect, I think, of architecture's actions, because we're doing so many things when we're asked to be architects, when we're asked to be designing spaces, when we're asked to be designing more and more often, not just spaces, but experiences, which I think is a very interesting thing and goes towards what Tanina was saying in terms of, you know, the application of what we're talking about on lots of different fields and different ways in, in which, you know, people are beginning to understand what the value of an atmosphere is. So one of the things that as I really feel that in, in architecture, the problem becomes that this idea of atmosphere becomes confused with the idea of style. And for me, it's always been a way to bring it back to um, the embodied cognition that happens within the body to take that conversation out of a stylistic framework, but to make it something that's maybe more authentic and can perhaps then help us to look at what is more universal between the experience of that bank teller and the person that walks into the bank. So to really look at it from the perspective of the body was really what drew me to the work of of you gentlemen and really looking at, you know, how, how else as practicing architects can we be looking at space? 
And the problem with the individual and the collective experience of space is also that it's that the, the creation and atmosphere is not defined, in my opinion, by the introduction of formulaic elements. And I don't think you're saying that. I'm just, you know, making that clear for most people, because every time we speak about this, the next question is, well, what are the rules for creating atmospheres and, and how can we do this? And, you know, where do we go from that? And I think the questions that we're trying to find answers to or find guidelines to are maybe much more complex and much more important. And to say that, you know, it's the ineff ineffable experience of a moment and how as architects can we make a case for that to our clients to say, I'm creating something ineffable. The only way I can show you this is by making it. And then you will know the value of what I've made. And so there's always this sense of being, you know, a bit of a snake oil salesperson when you're in the world making these things and you don't just get to say that it will happen, but you have to actually make it happen. And the, the other rewarding side of that is that when we're able to do that and really look at this continuous readjustment of our senses and our body in space and really recognize architecture, not just as a generator, but maybe as a catalyst, maybe as an affordance, maybe as a place for feeling, if we can really come from that, then this idea of empathy, Michael, that you brought up, I think is become super important and, and a way in which to recalibrate how as a profession, we're really thinking about what we're doing. Are we really doing this because we need to serve a client? Are we doing it because we need to empathize with the client? Are we doing it because we need, we have another function. And this distinction between then building and architecture becomes very important because we're not just looking to fulfill a brief, we're also looking to do something more than that with architecture. So I guess from my perspective, in terms of how do we make architectures, the answer is always different, but the answer always has to come back to how are we understanding space? Do we understand space just through our eyes? Do we understand it through all of our senses, not just the, the normal, a uh, few that everyone's used to. And what do those things actually mean in terms of creating maybe some ideas of um, communal experience and working both, you know, through the medium of art versus the medium of architecture. I've also had the privilege of maybe understanding what um, each of those fields can do separately. And uh, perhaps one gets to something a bit faster than the other. But, and by that, I mean, in art, sometimes it's easier to get people to experience something and to understand what you're trying to say. Whereas in architecture, you're kind of acting on them. And something you said to Nino, I was thinking about this. Oh, uh, no, it was Bob in your introduction. When you were talking about architecture being in the background, I was sort of thinking about it as almost like the workings of our body, that the working of your body is always in the background. And it's the thing that's driving everything. And if we think of architecture in the same way, then that unconscious kind of working that we leave in the background that in the end is absolutely essential to every second of your experience here and what you know, feel, understand, think, do, it's as important as that. So I guess that's where I'll leave it before I let somebody else jump in. So the, um, thank you, thank you, Suchi. Um, my brain is quite busy, so I'll just interject a couple things. Um, when I learned from um, this debate that uh, architecture is read in an instant, like a first impression, I both knew that and hated that. So that all this work, all this effort has now been read in a heartbeat. Something like a tenth of a second to a quarter of a second. And then we figured out on the other side of that, something close to us, between seven and nine minutes is required to change a mood in some full way. So real architecture is in that realm and yet is read in the first realm. And for me, one of these distinctions is that there's a difference between emotions and feelings. Emotions are immediate and unconscious. Feelings are only our cognitive of our own perceptions. Should we talk about first impressions, Tina? Would that be helpful? The first impression, okay, yeah. Uh, in, in relation with the, the problem of uh, affordance, of course, and the question of whether both atmosphere and affordance are a relational or non-relational concept, 
that something generated by a relationship between the subject and the world or prior to such a relationship. And the condition of possibility of it is still controversy. My first point is that atmospherology, especially when focusing on what I call a prototypical atmosphere and promoting an inflationary ontological inventory, can disregard the almost paranoid ecological fear for reification. Quasi-objective atmosphere are certainly entities and, and not only interactions, properties, or necessarily agent-related aspects as not physical things, but quasi-things, as I, like I call them, much like affordances, they are there even though they may not be actually perceived. A room tense atmosphere, for example, may not be noticed by those who enter it while feeling revved up. It is without suitable circumstances. It is still there as it pervades that particular lived space. This uh, my atmospherological, ecological rest realism shows no fear of reification, probably the important distinction between us. Uh, nor does it shy away from multiplying entities. This is primarily because it partially verify, verifies the very notion of entity by making it fluid. And secondly, because it devalues pragmatic questions like for whom and when. The, the example you quote, the, the bank holds atmosphere, obviously does not afford a two-year-old baby to feel awe or intimidation. However, this does not mean that this, that this imposed investment is not already potentially meaningful for the child too, by triggering a certain felt modular resonance of dim disquiet. Consider, for example, the atmosphere of narrowness that is idiosyncratically privileged by infants for its enveloping and protective character, while being felt as suffocating by adults because of the same felt bodily resonance, emotional narrowness. Only this ontological realist interpretation of atmosphere for me can account for the rich phenomenology of possible atmospheric encounters, including the dystonic perception of an atmosphere, the distinction between perceiving it and being really involved by it, the mood resistance a manipulative atmosphere, think for, think for example of experiences that are transgressive or at least freely randomized with respect to what the disciplinary power wants. Or also the reverse atmospheric feeling, for example, the sadness suggested by intolerable beauty, for example. For both affordances in atmospheres, one may wonder if they are merely dispositional environmental qualities. A mutualist dispositionalist perspective can only be maintained here cum granosalis in a certain way. In fact, if from the empirical and first person perspective, atmospheres are only are felt when they manifest themselves at a given time and in the right circumstances, when the feeling they afford is complete, from the ontological and third person one, they exist at least for a reference class of potential perceivers, even though no one is feeling them at this moment or is not yet aware of them, which is what perhaps happens most often. This means that they are feature of the environment even before manifesting themselves to a perceiver. I know this is a difficult and uh, for 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 more relationship position, <laughs> it's a very very close to neo phenomenological approach to to atmosphere as entities that are outside. It is is a, is a very uh, in the line of this uh, um, um, struggle against uh, the idea of introject introjectionism of feelings, of course. I think that's an amazing idea. Sorry, Bob. I, I'm, I'm excited by what Tuning was saying. We'll carry on. 
<laughs> well, I was just thinking, you know, and sometimes I open a lecture with a slide from the great beauty, you know, where the Japanese tourist like looks at Rome and just dies from the beauty of it. It's sort of like that, you know, the sadness of this intolerable beauty and this idea that um, spaces can have, can hold these feelings for us, even before we come into them. And this is really, I think, I think what we're talking about is the esoteric as it may sound to so many people listening in, I think is actually really the key to understanding how to take what we're talking about forward because it really reflects um, our own agency in interacting with architecture and really this kind of fluid relationship with architecture where architecture acts on us and we're acting on it to some degree that, you know, as, as being beings in a habitat, that this is, this is what happens. It's not necessarily a one way, um, one way interaction. And that's, um, that I think is maybe I'll stop there. That might be a little crazy. <laughs> well, the, uh, the, the notion of affordance is, uh, does a, a number of things for us. One, it makes um, atmospheres a biological condition. Um, I often will say that uh, it's interesting how we believe that once we've walked indoors, we're no longer part of the ecology. There is no ecology once we've stepped through a door and we're indoors. And maybe that's just their conditioning. So uh, the notion of affordance is, says we're always participant in it, and it moves our engagement from being a noun to a verb. Atmosphere is uh, instruction, it's information along with everything else. Michael, you, you have kind of a, a different view on affordance as you put it into two categories. Would that be useful to talk about? Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> there are so many issues that have come up. I, I want to start by attacking Tonino in a friendly fashion. Um, mm -hmm. He talks about this notion that there is a the same um, felt bodily resonance. That's his favorite um, term, I think, a felt bodily resonance of narrowness uh, that nonetheless uh, creates a, a shared atmosphere, but affects the kid who loves the narrow space and the adult who doesn't um, in different ways. But I, for me, that isn't really helpful to say, well, um, something narrow elicits a, a felt bodily resonance that is atmospheric. Um, narrowness can be used by the architect in many different ways. Um, it can create, to just take one example, rather than being counterproductive, uh, you may design a building where there is an entrance way that is long and narrow precisely to create a sense of anticipation. And then the atmosphere is one of excited anticipation rather than one of, of being closed in. So I just use that as, as one state. So I. Uh, one of my interests has been uh, to try and tease out some of the mechanisms of perception and the way in which many different subconscious processes may work together before one enters a coherent understanding of the scene that one is in. And I must confess that's been more in terms of what are the objects, the actions and relations in the scene um, rather than applying that, that theory to emotion. But I think in the same way, depending on what you attend to, you get a very different impression. Uh, if you travel the world, um, you will receive a plate of food that others uh, of the local persuasion are eating with gusto, and you recoil in disgust. Uh, you know, some people can't eat snails, for example, to take a relatively moderate thing, or, or a nice plate of locusts. Or what have you. So I'm very concerned about this idea that in every possible case, there is a shared underlying prototypical affordance. And then it's that is what people build on. I, I think they may be taking many different features subconsciously, which do not have affordance value and putting them together. Um, you may use color simply to segment a scene. When you look around to see where the faces of the people are, you can use a variety of skin tones to pull the face out from the background. And in that subconscious process, there is no affordance uh, of atmosphere saying, oh, this is a lovely skin color. Oh, I object to that skin color. That may come later after you've seen the face and the facial disposition of something. 
Okay, so that's it. Now, let me go to this <laughs> Taurus, poor Taurus, after spending all that money, dying um, on Encountering Rome. Now, again, yes. There, Michael, there it a, was a movie. It was a movie. Just, just bringing that up. Okay. Oh, they didn't die in one picture. They died over a period of time. Okay, a slow. Did, did they enjoy the ecstasy before they died? Oh, good. Okay. Now, what I want to contrast there again, there's that notion that many of us share that you go to Rome and, and it's, it's amazing. Uh, and yet, as we know, for centuries, the Roman population, the population of Rome was surrounded by these ruins 2,000 years old and totally ignored them, except perhaps as a site of finished stone for their own building. So I, I really can't get over this fact that no matter the fact that there are certain things that are basic human mechanisms that operate non-consciously, to understand atmosphere, you really have to bring in the person in relation to the, the, the space and you have to bring in the enculturation of the person that, that can modify it. And that doesn't mean that I'm saying ignore the subconscious thing. As I've said, we start with Gibson's example. You're walking down the street, you avoid a collision, uh, not because you've learned how to avoid a collision, but just because you have an inbuilt mechanism that will recognize from the optic flow that a collision is imminent. And without any conscious thought, you're there. Similarly, like withdrawing your hand from a burning surface. You're aware that you touched a burning surface only after you've withdrawn your hand. So, so let me just close with one slogan. No, I'm going to close with two things. So one is, one is the slogan um, that uh, Suchi has invoked of uh, embodied cognition and the embodied, which goes on to the embodied mind. And I just want to remind us that the body by itself is not very interesting. It's a dead thing on a slab. And so we have to think about the embrained body. And that is, I think, where not necessarily the science, the neuroscience comes in, but at least the, the cognitive science and psychology. And then the other, just an analogy I offer that I, I, I wonder if Tonino has, has pursued this because I think it's a very interesting one is one of my former students who worked on brain modeling uh, has a daughter who is a nose. And that means that she works for a perfume company and has learned how to use this immense repertoire of different uh, aromas, some of which singly may be quite obnoxious, and yet combine them in such a way to have a perfume that will meet um, the needs of different people and give them certain, if you will, hey, think about this, a certain atmospheric impression. And so I, I wonder if, uh, for those of us who are interested in studying atmosphere more generally and not just immediately in terms of architecture, understanding perfumery uh, might be an interesting way to spend some of our time. Well, the olfactory is, is part of the game. Tonino? Of course, of course. There is, the first book on atmosphere is a, from a psychopathologist about smell. Then it's very, very sure that the smell, smell is a big, great uh, atmospheric power over us. And uh, probably I can say something about atmosphere and architecture and the generability of architectural forms, if you want. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, architects try to design affordance based atmospheres through architectural forms. I would like to stop here on just two points. Architectural affordances are as gestures and the question of the intentional generability of architectural atmospheres. Architects can, for example, conceive all visible entities, walls, windows, doors, etc., as gestures, gesting motor figures for the user, precisely as spatial gestures suggesting certain movements, behaviors, actions, and even moods. This makes architectural design a kind of scenic thought based on the spontaneous and circular intertwinement between the repertoire of architectural gestures, or ordinances, giving the beholder a lived and felt bodily direction and the user's repertoire of felt bodily and spatial experiences and disposition. 
primary architectural gestures, as for example, the vertical attitude, the distinction between here and there, and as absolute places, borders between, uh, between inside and outside, and various ways of developing the fluctuation between felt bodily contraction and expansion have clearly an atmospheric power. The acute angle of a building radiates a sheltering mood in the interior space, but a nostril one outside. Bernini's colonnade forces the visitor to approach St. Peter's in Rome in a fearful and reverent manner. The wall accompanies the walker for a while, also determining the, all the, the, the way one walks, but also how one feels when walking. Trying to apply to architecture the already, already mentioned phenomenology of our daily atmospheric games, I would like to suggest the following basic types of atmospheric encounters. In short, uh, for me, an architectural atmosphere can, one, overwhelm us, two, find us in tune with it, to the point of not being recognized and felt, hence some embarrassing inadequacy, like moving in a disorderly manner in a church or in a too conventional way during a party. Three, the atmosphere can be recognized without being really felt. Four, it can elicit a resistance that pushes us to change it. Five, it can concretize itself even in materials that normally express the opposite, thus giving life to an affective inversion. And finally, six can be perceived differently over the course of time, but always, for me, of course, on the base of the first atmospheric impression. This first atmospheric impression always imposes its original feeling data, even if this happens in a context of open possibilities, depending if one is walking through a building or seeing it from the outside, changing its views, knowing its history or not, etc. Any possible change in time can be only considered as a relatively different declination for me of the first paradigmatic atmospheric impression. Before superficially declaring that two individuals perceive different atmosphere, one should at least wonder whether the difference does not simply lie in their affective field reaction to the same, in brackets, atmosphere they encounter. The second point is on vulnerability. One of the most important philosophical issues also concerns architecture. Can atmospheric feelings be intentionally generated or are they just a vague and obscure ob object of desire? Obviously, there are no recipes for the design of an atmosphere, nor is an atmosphere that is only planned a full atmosphere yet. Nevertheless, architects can try to express the aura of the building in its intended place, as Sumter said, can simulate through a prognostic body scheme and role-playing competence, the future body feeling of the beholder, but most of all, explicitly rely on some form of self-bodily complicity on the side of the beholder, thus contradicting the thesis that atmospheres always escape analysis and cannot be addressed or controlled, as said by Wigley, for example. If there is an illusion in designing architectural atmosphere, it is the same illusion which the human heterogeneous of ends is based on. Atmospheres always certainly depend on the co perception of past and expected atmospheric situations. The atmosphere, atmosphere of an hospital, for example, tends precisely because we anticipate the situation that will follow and or because we remember earlier ones. And yet, they may certainly also be the successful outcome of a design, even based on some counterfactual thought. What atmosphere would the patients and their families feel if there was a door there, a window there, a garden visible from your room, etc. In short, architects are certainly capable of generating concrete atmospheres and do not simply suggest and evoke them. Sure. Like basic moods, also atmospheres 
but sometimes it's only a transcendental, unconscious background perceptive condition rather than an object of transitive perception. But this is always, this is not always the case. Sometimes atmosphere are the precise expressive way in which things, in our case, architectural places and things, call, call, call for us or even look at us, even making us no, long, no longer master of the situation we are experiencing. The distinction for, probably between me and Michael is that you, uh, he, he thinks of atmosphere in the sense of perceiving something atmospherically. But I also think of, uh, I perceive uh, an atmosphere, not only atmospherically, an atmosphere, an entity that is outside. So we, we only have about 10 minutes or less here left, but um, oh, I'd like to see this. Suchi, could you sum this up? Can you, can you think about how um, architects might be able to <clears throat> use this? I mean, uh, um, for me, the, the, the atmosphere from an architectural standpoint is um, an offer to avoid certain behavior. And uh, it's a bit like, um, hearing music or something where the offer is present and then depending on what you bring with you, um, what that strength and what you might do with it. What do, what do you think about? I, you know, I think Tonino actually, as I was listening to him, was thinking he's laying out so beautifully the task of an architect and what we do every day in terms of thinking about the things that we do. But this idea of being able to amplify a disposition is something that I think as architects, we perhaps don't take seriously enough. And I think that's why these conversations are incredibly important to me because I think that's the true power of architecture. And we need to go there as a profession in order to be able to really reclaim uh, something of the importance of what, you know, these examples of architecture that we refer to from, from other periods of time, um, that, that architecture of our time can do the same for us, you know, in that sense. But I do think if we're gonna, you know, try to sum up to some degree. And I've been looking at some of the questions and I think they're hitting the nail on the head where it's some of it is about, you know, how do we bridge these different kinds of languages, whether it's Michael's language and Tonino's language, or, you know, my language in, in physical space and your language in physical space, Bob. And, and um, the, the knowledge that we get from the work of Tonino and Michael, um, is that as architects, it really is what we do and what we can do with the work that we see and receive is that we're also the people who translate the knowledge. So I think that this kind of translational mode is something that we need to arrive at. If, we want, if we're wanting to take this field forward, we really need to think about A, how to translate this language. Um, so that it doesn't just get devolved into either sensory design, design for well-being, or you know things like that that become um, somewhat of a reductive recipe, and to really think about what the amplification possibilities are in everything that we do. And I think good architecture always does that. You know, we know that when we walk into it. And um, I would tend to agree with Tonino that it um, uh, is an external experience, but something that can only be fully experienced internally. So once we've set up that kind of very complicated interaction, which all of us are doing all the time in space, um, finding that kind of collective language to bring that together and to bring kind of the importance of architecture back to this idea of, yes, we can actually affect how people feel to be able to say that, you know, and to say it, um, loudly and, and proudly and, and expect people to be able to pay us well to prioritize that. I think that's something that, uh, you know, I would probably want to work on. Well, we just have a few minutes left and I'll give Michael the last words uh, after I take a few. The, um, uh, one of the things that comes out of uh, this debate is the idea that the body resonates and um, for architects, they might consider that um, not as an abstraction, but as an actual physical experience and as a fact and as a craft. And that if architects would see themselves 
as an instrument of atmosphere as they're working, particularly in the digital settings. And you know, scientists look at things from the outside with their tools. Musicians play their tools. And the tool of the architect is the body. And if they would use that body as a way of tuning and understanding spaces in this kind of resonant way, I think that would be of some use to our profession, help us, uh, as you suggest, maybe improve the building. But um, Michael, take, take the last word, if you would. I am not worthy. Uh, but what I would like to do Always is- Always worthy. Yeah, I would like to close not by- um, debating or, or commenting further upon the excellent contributions of, of, of the three of you, but to take it back to the study of emotion as something that we, we might add a little bit more fully into this uh, conversation. Uh, when we study emotion, we find that we can study it from two ways. We have evolved to have facial expressions of emotion. And this is very much, if you will, the primordial social atmosphere. I see somebody angry, I see somebody sad, I see somebody inviting, I see somebody interesting, and this modifies my behavior. And so I think understanding that is an important part, both of empathy and of uh, thinking about atmosphere. On the other hand, um, there is the issue of um, emotion as in some sense a behavioral disposition. I think we, we began to touch on that uh, a little while ago that when you're in a building, um, yes, th there may be the sort of pure tourist who goes to the building to go ooh, ah, and take a selfie. But in general, you're designing a building which people will behave. And uh, then the issue is to what extent does atmosphere uh, modulate set patterns of, of appropriate behavior? And, and so perhaps to close, we'll go back through the famous uh, bank example of Tonino and the famous counter example of Bob Condia. And that is that what do you want a person to do when they enter the bank? Do you want to create this atmosphere in which they are intimidated and um, will in some sense kowtow to you, uh, the banker, in trying to get the loan? Or do you want to create an atmosphere in which they can consider the bank as a reliable member of the community who can help them with their um, financial needs? So I think I close just with this idea of emotion, both in terms of what is its internal expression and the way it sets dispositions for our ongoing behavior. Uh, and, and think then about um, this issue of the classical affordances of how do you behave and the atmospheric affordances of how do you feel and encourage us to better understand um, those mechanisms at the level of individuals socially interacting and then how that can give us new insights into thinking about the design of spaces and how people interact with those spaces. Well, thank you, Michael. And thank you, Tanino. It's been a pleasure to meet you and, and uh, Sushi, see you once again. My pleasure. Peto, did you want to come back on and say something? Or should we just wave goodbye? Yeah, here I am. Thank you. I, again, I thank you all for such an interesting conversation. Uh, and thank you to all of you who participated. I want to remind um, that the questions that we couldn't answer will be answered via email. Uh, and if you have any more questions, just email us and we'll do our best to answer to you as quickly as possible. We'll have a recording of this ready in a couple of weeks. We'll send out an email to everyone on the list. Uh, and thank you, thank you, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great weekend, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take Hopefully. care. <laughs> <laughs>